four o'clock. Our workshops have been scheduled where no action will be taken. So you will not uh, have any types of, of motions that are made today to open, close, or discuss any items uh, that will require a majority uh, vote of the board. That being said, today we have on our agenda four different items. Uh, for those supervisors that are not here in person, you'll get a packet of information in the mail uh, along with a copy of Robert's Rules, uh, the latest edition. And will you have a Robert's Rules training scheduled for a future date of a workshop that's on your annual calendar as well. Uh, but that being said, it's four o'clock. So if we could turn it over to the Warren County Historical Society for the presentation on the Joseph Warren, Warren Center for History and Leadership, please. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Sieber. Um, I'm Terry Rogers. I'm the Executive Director of the Warren County Historical Society. And here with me today, I have members of the Society's Board of Trustees and Officers, along with our partner in the project, Shane Newell, who you'll be hearing from uh, in just a few minutes. I wanted to give a little bit of a background before I turn the program over to Shane to give you the vision and concept plan for the Joseph Warren House Visitors Museum project. Our officers that are involved in this project are Dr. Stan Sanferrano, who also doubles as your Warren County historian, Joan Aldis, who is also the Queensbury historian, Tom Lynch, John Barry, Marianne Moran, Steve and Andrea Matt, and Wayne Madison. Another key person in our project team is Queensbury Supervisor John Strau, who himself is a very noted Joseph Warren historian. About 18 months ago, the Warren County Historical Society had the opportunity to consider use of the house next door to us on Gurney Lane. Since 2017, we've been um, creating a museum and a destination venue on Gurney Lane and uh, we really stepped up to the challenge that the Board of Supervisors gave to us when you so kindly offered us the use of this house for our historical society and to create a museum. But we do have some long-term plans. And in the course of our own strategic planning, we were very delighted to be approached by Shane Newell, who is a Lake George native currently residing in Massachusetts, as well as John Strau, to talk about an exciting way to use the house next door in a joint venture history project that would essentially create a one-of-a-kind national historic site on our compound on Gurney Lane that would honor the history and legacy of Joseph Warren, for whom our county has, is named. Shane Newell, over the course of his adult life, has amassed a great collection of Joseph Warren memorabilia, ephemera, and art, and he has become a noted Joseph Warren historian. He's indicated a desire to find a place to showcase this wonderful collection and also to honor the memory of Joseph Warren and what he meant for the creation of our American democracy. So we have partnered with him in an exciting venture, which would create not only a history center, but also a center where in the spirit of Joseph Warren, we could uh, encourage leadership education. About eight months ago, we um, had a, a structural engineering examination of the house, which obviously will need a lot of work. It's a vintage 1922 house, just as ours is. And uh, Ryan Biggs of Clifton Park did an excellent job, uh, pro bono work for us, and determined that the house itself is in very satisfactory condition in order to create the type of history center that we envision. Two times in the past 18 months, we have met with County Administrator Ryan Moore to talk to him about our plans, and he has been extremely supportive. What I'd like to do now is turn the program over to Shane Newell. Shane is a native of Lake George, former owner of the grist mill. He and his family have been living for many years now in Ludlow, Massachusetts. 
Shane is an executive in charge of real estate operations for Bay State Medical, and he is currently quite involved in leading the COVID response at Bay State Medical in Massachusetts. He is a Joseph Warren historian. He's the author of Joseph Warren and the Boston Rebellion. He and his family have a five-year plan along to coincide with our five-year plan in creating the museum to return to this area where he was born and raised. I would like to turn the program now over to Shane to talk specifically about the vision and concept plan. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and what I'd like to do is introduce the, uh, the group here to uh, a draft plan of what the campus would look like and uh, more or less what the museum concept really is all about. So let me try this. I'll take you through it. Is my screen visible? Nope. No, don't see anything. Nope, I'm not muted. Nope. Oop. How's that? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with where we uh, we are today with the building that uh, Terry just referenced adjacent to the current uh, uh, historical society. Uh, this structure uh, uniquely has some features that are very similar to the home which Joseph Warren was born in Roxbury, Massachusetts. So the question for us is how do we turn that into a museum and exactly what is it and, and what kind of museum will it take for it to stand out because museums today are struggling for, for uh, attendance and, and engagement. So we wanna make something really exceptional here. Well, I guess the way to start this is maybe tell you what it's not going to be. And that is, it's not going to be a fine art museum. These collections are ex extremely valuable. Uh, they, they take centuries to, uh, to assemble and it's just not the vision we see uh, being successful here. Uh, don't necessarily as a historic museum of, uh, of extraordinary artifacts from the from that period either. Uh, that really what those history artifacts are already showcased in the uh, in the museum at the historical society. Uh, very common history museums are also living museums like uh, uh, Colonial Williamsburg and Old Sturbridge Village. Extensive staffing requirements and building requirements. So this isn't really what we think we can do here. Um, Again, the building looks like Joseph Warren's uh, uh, birthplace in Roxbury. This is an early engraving of it. Uh, another postcard from, uh, from the early period. Uh, again, here, here, here. Very, so it's, it's, it's an image people that's iconic associated to Joseph Warren. Uh, this is the way the building looked in the 1970s. Uh, unfortunately, uh, by the 1980s, it was in terrible disrepair and was thought that it would be, uh, would be torn down uh, unfortunately, it was saved and it currently looks like this today, but uh, it's a, a rental property. Um, there's no activity, no association to Joseph Warren. So although he's a national character mentioned by Ronald Reagan in, the national, uh, in his inauguration speech, uh, a very famous character, there's no place dedicated to his legacy and memory. Uh, so what would it be? If we were to preserve the honor of Joseph Warren in, in his home, this is what we want to create. What his house would have looked like if it was, uh, it was preserved to honor his life. These museums are not all that uncommon. Uh, the Museum uh, of uh, uh, John Adams is very much uh, a home museum. Th these are photographs of, of that. Uh, in fact, the uh, home of John Adams has uh, a portrait of Joseph Warren over the fireplace painted by John Singleton Copley. Uh, this is the library of, of John Adams' home. Uh, this is actually part of my collection and give you a flavor for the kind of historic references that I have and, and are, uh, I'm looking to create this type of atmosphere. Uh, again, here, uh, I have a large ephemera collection of related to early American and colonial history, uh, much to do with Boston and Joseph Warren's uh, involvement in multiple leadership levels. Uh, there's a portrait of Joseph Warren uh, to the left there. Uh, also parts of my collection include an extensive uh, historic library. These are photographs of those sections. This is the most famous portrait of Joseph Warren. Um, it's at the Fine Art Museum in Boston and I was uh, given permission to 
uh, that re replicate this this in every uh, aspect of it. It's a very large painting, and mine is mine. Uh, I had this painted by uh, uh, Bradley Stevens, who is probably the most renowned historic artist of our time, uh, doing doing paintings currently for the uh, U.S. Senate, uh, the Smithsonian, um, and other Washington properties. This is a very uh, this is another portrait in my collection, of Joseph Warren. This is when he gave his very famous speech at the uh, at the, uh, uh, the, the commemoratives uh, to the Boston Massacre speech that he did at the uh, Old South Meeting House while wearing a Ciceronian toga. Another portrait of him replicating the one at the John John Adams Museum. So we see the interior of this building looking very similar to a home residence with these Joseph Warren memorabilia where instructions can be provided by uh, pa perhaps costumed uh, interpreters, uh, inst uh, instructions on leadership and on the life of Joseph Warren, uh, different types of events, cultural events, uh, educational events. Uh, even per perhaps small musical events. So uh, even perhaps even some outdoor events. I wanna take you through now, just quickly looking at the campus that we're dealing with uh, the first step of this campus would be to address this building, of course, to create the uh, Joseph Warren House Visitors Museum, perhaps add some sidewalks and outdoor patio area, some signage area down on the bottom there, that, that dark arch. Uh, we would envision the space to eventually have uh, another structure between the two structures, that potentially. Now, this is really reaching out there for long-term vision uh, of a structure that would, that would house a new uh, facility and then fence in the compound area for uh, a true living campus uh, of education and history. And it would essentially the historical society would, uh, would oversee these multiple functions, a museum of local history and what we're calling the independence theater uh, and our freedom library that would be housed in, in one of the two buildings. Again, a, a vision logo, history for modern use is sort of a coined phrase that we've been using lately. Uh, because we really feel it is important. Leadership is something that we're, we want to promote. A lot of folks think of Joseph Warren, of his tremendous uh, contribution to our country and his sacrifice at the Battle of Bunker Hill, which he was killed. But we forget that he was also uh, an astounding leader. Uh, he, was, he was Grand Master of the Lodge uh, of, of uh, Freemasons, which was the you know, political movement of the time. He was the uh, orator. He was a famous uh, uh, propagandist for American liberty, uh, perhaps the first to introduce the ideas of uh, separation from Britain and, and true independence. He was president of our of the provincial Congress uh, here in here in Boston. He was uh, he was renowned renowned as the leader of the Sons of Liberty, and uh, he was a, he was also the president of the Safety Committee, which of course they couldn't have a war council, so the Safety Committee is how they were able to get. Uh, a military action uh, to stop the uh, stop the British uh, encampments and uh, and uh, oppositions that they were facing in Boston. We've, we've uh, this is a, a portrait of Joseph Warren stand, uh, sitting next to uh, Paul Revere, John Adams, Sam Adams, and John Hancock. Um, and this is more or less how we've come up with the phrase of a house visitors museum. Not only the visitors that. Joseph Warren often accommodated, but also those that would come and hopefully visit his historic home, which would be now uh, sited in Warren County, New York. That's what I have uh, available for questions. This was very informative and interesting. Thank you to Terry and Shane and your, all your members that are on the call today. We do have a, a couple of minutes for questions before we uh, move on to our next agenda item. Are there questions at all or comments? Mm. Uh, I see Supervisor Bramer. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. This is uh, really exciting. I had the opportunity this summer to go into the historical uh, building and got a full tour. Thank you, Terry and all of the staff who um, welcomed me that day. And we have a lot of really cool things going on in there. They've really taken our 
um, direction to make this an exciting place for our visitors to understand our history. So I encourage all of the supervisors to get over there and check it out when you have time because it is a really great resource for us and for our, our residents and our visitors. So I look forward to um, the future vision, like was mentioned, and building that up a little bit. That's very exciting. And Terry, I haven't made it through your whole book, but so far it's great. I know it's been a few Thanks. months, but it's really, really <laughs> exciting. Good read. Thank you. Thank you. I'll throw thank that plug in there for you. Thank you, Supervisor Stroud. Yes, thank you. I mean, uh, Joseph Warren, um, the man whose actions and words uh, struck the match that lit the powder keg that would become the revolution and our separation from Britain. Um, I want to thank the Historical Society and Shane for taking leadership. I think this is uh, going to be one of the greatest things to have happened to this area in a long time. It certainly is inspiring. And I think it'll become uh, help us become a destination point if we can go through with this and we're certainly going to work hard to do so and and i can think of no other worthy cause than in the name of joseph warren um, and thank you shane thank you historical society well thank you again and i'm sure we all join in supervisor strauss sentiment so um we look forward to to seeing what becomes of the center thank you again and at this point in time we'll turn the meeting agenda over to our soy on water uh jim lieberman please Hi, uh, thanks for having me this afternoon. Um, just going to go through kind of quickly on the uh, on the projects, programs, and accomplishments that we had from uh, the Soil and Water Conservation District this past year. Uh, I'm going to go quick. Um, there may be some time at the end for questions. If not, feel free to uh, shoot me any chat or uh, emails. So, need to be here. So. First of all, I will say that I did not put the presentation together. That's Marin Alexander. She's uh, quite a whiz at the new technology. So I take no credit for putting it together uh, with the exception of uh, kind of uh, providing some information as we all did. But uh, we deal with a lot of different projects, programs uh, across the county for municipalities, landowners, organizations, uh, businesses. Um, and this might give you an idea of some of what we do. So we were actually formed in 1956. So we're 65 years old. Um, I think that might surprise a lot of people that it's, uh, you know, we're older than the DEC. Um, and this is strictly for Warren County. These are all things in our district law that we're able to work on and work for. I think a couple of the interesting ones though that stand out from uh, the others are, you know, protection of the public lands and the tax base, uh, promoting additional tourism and employment opportunities, um, you know, and health and safety and general welfare of the people. So <clears throat> there's a lot of things that, that uh, we have the ability to take on. Um, and if you ever have any questions about it, let me know. Uh, dealing with water quality, we work with the municipalities to uh, reduce runoff and, and uh, try to attempt to uh, improve stormwater runoff, uh, reduce uh, landowners problems, municipal problems. This is actually a project in uh, the town of Queensbury and Lake Sunnyside. Um, and we don't just uh, get funding to, to actually uh, pay for supplies and materials. That's actually Nick Rowell, the natural resource specialist. We've all spent a lot of time with rakes, shovels, chainsaws in our hands, actually assisting the municipalities install projects. Uh, up in Warrensburg, uh, town of Warrensburg Highway Department at their new garage, they ended up doing the same type of thing. They did a porous pavement that is a, a grass paving area um, where water can infiltrate, doesn't run off. Um, you know, it's just because, um, you know, it's not connected directly to a water body uh, doesn't mean that we can't do better with pollution prevention, uh, good housekeeping as it were. Uh, we did pay for, out of one of our DEC grants, uh, precast porous concrete uh, sidewalk slabs for the village of Lake George. Um, these got, were installed on Webster Ave a few years ago with the City of Glens Falls through one of their grants. Uh, we learned some stuff with that, um, but this is really the new technologies that you're, you're going to see. This is what falls under green infrastructure. And uh, it's, uh, they're, they're fun projects to work on and you see immediate results. The MS4 program, which I believe all the supervisors are familiar with, or, or most of them are familiar with, the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, 
um, I'm the stormwater management officer for the county. And um, there's a different, uh, uh, different requirements uh, that have to be done every year. And some of it's education outreach, obviously in the year of COVID, it's a little difficult to get volunteers, uh, but we did do some stuff with volunteers. But um, you know, what are we looking for? Again, it's water quality improvement. Um, you actually don't wanna see purple. That's a, a chemical reaction showing that, I believe it's uh, nitrogen. We don't wanna see nitrogen, excess nitrogen in the water. Oops, sorry. There we go. Water quality in the Northway. The uh, Lake George Association uh, received in 2019 a grant for water quality improvements. Again, using softer structures. This actually uh, image was taken by the Lake George Association. Uh, if you are familiar with exit 22, the parking area is right up by where water quality is listed here. So the ramp comes through here. Uh, drainage comes down this macadam channel. Now what it does, it's diverted through a, uh, a grass lined waterway and into a uh, dispersal pool. And then anything that flows beyond that goes down the hill. Right now you can actually see where it is because it's seeing the snow away, but uh, it's uh, a, far, a market improvement than having it run directly down into Lake George. I can't say enough about our uh, local DOT uh, working on these and accepting these projects. They want to do more. They want to do a lot better because just in the I-87 exit 22 area um, between culverts, drop inlets, and uh, other conveyance type of structures, there are nearly 100 DOT structures. Take that up and down the Northway and you can see the impact we have from um, I-87 on our waters. We have an agreement with the city of Glens Falls. We actually go out and uh, utilize a, uh, a monitor that they have to the water supply reservoirs. And uh, this is actually, uh, as you know, we had a dry year and uh, this is uh, one of them. It's uh, actually got lower than this. And uh, it was tough on some of the reservoirs, but uh, Bob Bombard from my office provides a, a report at the end of the year to uh, Steve Gersler in the city. And, uh, you know, trying to make sure that they're keeping an eye on uh, all the parameters and the, uh, you know, what people are considering to be something uh, new, uh, harmful algal bloom constituents. We do a lot of erosion control. We have a hydro seeder. We have a power mulcher. 16 acres doesn't seem like a lot, but when you uh, divide that by, uh, you know, the width of this, which is probably 14 feet, it's uh, quite a few lane miles. We also do uh, uh, erosion sediment control training. Some of you who are in the uh, attendance today in the audience have gone through that training. We did 30 trainings last year. We had 10 of them completed that were in person. Uh, then the pause started and then we ended up doing 20 via Zoom. And we had over 600 trainees from across the state. That actually is an earned income item for us that helps offset um, some of our budget costs. The Westbrook Conservation Initiative, we're charged with uh, operation maintenance, coordination of the projects and programs there, but it's owned by the county and uh, Village of Lake George. And the three E's um, have the uh, um, uh, conservation easement on it. So I am down there almost monthly to take a look at it, quarterly reports on how everything is doing. And then we did quite a bit of maintenance this year on the uh, four bay, which removed sediment off from Route 9 and uh, an excess amount of cattails. So uh, we have the Lake George Waterkeeper there, Chris Novitsky and Alex Novick from the Land Conservancy. So it's a, I, it, I can't say enough about it. It is a tremendous partnership amongst all the uh, folks involved. And sediment basins, uh, these were put in uh, by the Lake George Association in our office back a number of years ago, and they are still maintained. Uh, they capture excess amounts of sediment from going down into the lake, uh, Lake George, and forming additional uh, area of deltas. Um, we assisted the Lake George Association on this, and again, it's not just you know um, doing coordination. Uh, we're actually doing the dewatering. We're deploying the turbidity curtains. We're, I'm doing the permit work. So you know, we look at it as you know, we're all in this together. And uh, if everyone takes a little piece, uh, it's, a, it's a lot easier lift to get these done. And roadside stabilization, um, we belong to two uh, local watershed organizations. One is the Upper Hudson and one is the Champlain Watershed Coalition. 75% of our land mass in the county drains to the Upper Hudson River and 25% and drains to Lake Champlain. Uh, the 25% 
is not just Lake George, it includes Halfway Brook. So uh, depending on what watershed we're in, we are uh, we get different grants to pay for supplies and materials. Uh, it's not going to look like this forever. Grass and other vegetation is gonna be growing up. These green filter socks are gonna be removed. So we're gonna have a grass flow path to capture, slow down water, capture sediment, uptake nutrients. And we have rock as scour protection. We work on fish and wildlife habitat. We work on uh, a lot of aquatic and uh, habitat improvement projects. And this year we had a grant that we were working with the Lake George Land Conservancy. We provided uh, Zoom training to a lot of folks and scout restoration kits. Um, if you wanna know what those are, contact our office. Um, but we work uh, across the county for habitat improvement. And again, it's uh, for brook trout, for ducks, um, for uh, other fish and wildlife. Pollinators, uh, green infrastructure, that plays right into that. Warren County Bikeway, we did a lot of work on that this year. Other projects and programs. Some of you have may have seen that uh, we started, it's called the Warren County Tree Challenge. I'd like to thank Sarah Frankenfeld from planning for uh, putting uh, time and effort into getting us through this. And, uh, you know, forestry is a big uh, item in our county and hiking, uh, walking, hunting, fishing, and a lot of uh, recreational pursuits really drive what, <clears throat> you know, our economy and, and what we do. Uh, the map on the left, if it is a light color green, it's, it's, forest land of some type. The dark green is wetland. So we have a significant amount of forests. Um, there's a several of us who have a big forestry background and we enjoy people uh, getting to know trees, forests a little bit better. So we came up with this app. Uh, we think it's a fun little uh, app to use. We also assist uh, on small projects. We're able to fund through earned income that we get from the state for a series of tasks that we accomplish. My board splits some of the funding up and we're able to give back to the communities that help support us. Um, soil restoration uh, in the height, an existing high tunnel at Warren Washington Association of Mental Health, a new inside beehive uh, at Up Yonder Farm. Um, you know, there, th that's not unusual for us to provide assistance for. We do a lot of trainings. We get tagged and asked to do trainings. And these are some of them. Uh, most of them were via Zoom, but uh, yeah, New York State Emergency Management Association, that was a big conference that I did a presentation for last uh, February. We do a lot of work with SUNY Adirondack now. I was actually asked to do erosion sediment control training with the DOT. So we do many, many different trainings throughout the year. Uh, I'm going, this is going to take a, just a, a minute, but uh, <clears throat> I might cut it short. Through Quickney, we were able to uh, purchase this sandbox model, which is at Up Yonder Farm. It's a uh, virtual reality sandbox model. I'll let you just take a look at it. It's a projection down onto sand, and with that, you're able to make topographic maps. Um, obviously, Rick here is showing you how, how it, you can use it as a scientific method for uh, education and outreach. <clears throat> and it is available again at Up Yonder Farm. I'm just going to skip through that. <clears throat> but that is something that's really neat now, and it provides them the ability to teach at a higher level on some of this stuff, plus do it virtually. I'm the hazard mitigation coordinator for the county. Uh, we work with the emergency services. Um, they last year purchased a six inch pump, which you see behind uh, Brian LaFleur here. <clears throat> and uh, we've uh, towed it around to a couple different job sites. We've used it. it Brian asked us to bring it over to Bolton after the fire in Bolton to help uh, with the U uh, New York State Fire Marshals. <clears throat> Something I've never done. We go out there and uh, we're driving around. We never know what we're going to run into. Actually, this is as a result, uh, Marn and I were trapped on Patton Aram Road because these trees fell down behind us after a thunderstorm, <coughs> pardon me, rolled by. But uh, we got a chain out from our uh, one uh, piece of equipment that we had up by the bridge. We pulled this out and used a, a fence pole basically or a street sign pole as a, a lever just to get the out of there so we could get home. But um, we provide assistance after storm events uh, with municipalities for cost assessments. Uh, that's a lot of the stuff of what we really enjoy doing. <clears throat> we enjoy working with the communities. Nothing can undo the damage. <clears throat> what 
we do have agriculture in our county and it's growing. Uh, we actually have prime farmland and farmland of statewide importance makes up about 9% of our, our land in Warren County. Unfortunately, about a third to uh, 40, uh, 33 to 40% of that's already developed uh, of some, some type of development. So we actually do not have a lot of this prime farmland, but we work with uh, other producers on uh, marginal farmland to make it, uh, make it worthwhile. And uh, we believe in locally sourced products. <laughs> we received a National Association of Conservation District Urban Ag Conservation Grant. I'd like to point out we were only one of 20 districts across 14 states um, to receive that. And uh, that was quite, uh, we were quite happy of that. And that was in the town of Warrensburg. We ended up doing a lot of training on that, uh, basically using raised beds, cover crops. <clears throat> it all comes back to resource management. <clears throat> We do, uh, we do have awards. The Conservationist of the Year was Randy Rath uh, for the work that he does in the Lake George watershed and beyond. Uh, Randy works for the Lake George Association. After passing of Mr. Montessi, our longtime board member, we uh, created a, an award to recognize folks in the community, uh, not associated with agencies or anything. And we recognize this year, Lee Rounds, who's a, a head uh, landscaper at uh, Queensbury School. And he is one of our ag farmers, uh, Christmas tree farmer. Jeremy Farrell, who is a professor at RPI, who uh, assists us tremendously. Uh, actually, we were just, we got, we're on the phone with him about every week to get information. <clears throat> and Tom O'Day, who uh, I'm sure some of you know, spends a lot of time volunteering up here in Warrensburg at Rotary, uh, Rotary events, and he's a master gardener. Anytime we need assistance with gardening, uh, Tom is there for us. I'd like to recognize our partners. Actually, I went through this today and made sure that it was accurate. That's everybody we worked with in one form or another this past year, even with COVID. Um, that's how we get things done. We are not a standalone by any means. Um, but we, we know how to partner with folks and work with other, other groups and agencies. Our 2020 board members, uh, we couldn't have done it without them. So we'd like to provide thanks to them. We're looking forward to a nice year this year. And that's the staff. So that's who, if you call, you're going to get one of us. And uh, I would encourage you, if you ever have any questions, comments, to email um, or call us. Um, I think uh, all of you interact with us. And uh, if you have any questions, then uh, please feel free to uh, contact my office. And thank you very much. That was informative and exciting to see what you've accomplished during 2020. And we look forward to 2021. Congratulations to all your award recipients. And again, thank you to you and your staff and for your board of directors. And for any member, you know, please feel free to reach out to Jim on behalf of the board. Thank you again. At this time, we'll move over to our 4.30 uh, agenda item, which is to hear from our Hospitality and Tourism Task Force. At this point in time, I believe I see Mark Bean, and uh, I'll, Mark, I'll let you introduce the members of the task force that are here with you today. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Sieber. Good afternoon, Supervisors. We uh, really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you this afternoon, and we sincerely appreciate your interest. Let me uh, introduce the people who are with me this afternoon, members of the Hospitality Communications Group. Sarah Mannix is the founder of Mannix Marketing in Glens Falls, which, as you know, many of you know, is a digital marketing agency. Uh, she's also the founder of Mannix Tourism, which works with more than 200 destination businesses and organizations internationally. And Sam Luciano is the president of the Fort William Henry Corporation, where he's worked for 36 years. He's also a member of the Board of Governors of Best Western Hotels. And uh, you may have seen uh, the Albany Business Review profile of Sam just about a week ago. He is the acknowledged local expert on data collection and analysis in the hotel industry. And I'm Mark Bean. I'm the president of Bean Communications in Glens Falls. And as you're sitting there this afternoon, uh, supervisors and listening to the good work of the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District and the vision of the Warren County Historical Society, you have to be thinking to yourself, this is wonderful work. How are we going to sustain this? How do we provide funding going forward for all of this good work? And I think that the answer may lie, at least in part, in tourism. Um, about 10 months ago, I was asked by the leadership of this board to join the Warren County Recovery Task Force uh, to work with other people in the business community to chart a path to get uh, 
the local economy restarted safely after the shutdown. And it became clear immediately that there should be special, urgent focus on tourism and hospitality because of the immediate disproportionate impact of the shutdown on tourism and the impact on the county's sales tax receipts and on occupancy tax revenue. And I offered to form that group. So 10 months later now, our tourism task force, which is known as the Hospitality Communications Group, continues to meet weekly. We get together at three o'clock every Monday afternoon on Zoom. And our calls now include up to about 40 people, uh, all local leaders in tourism and hospitality, the local chambers, uh, and several supervisors who join us on a regular basis. And let me stop there and please accept our invitation to join us any week. We would love to have you have your advice and input and your questions. It's an informal group. It's a private sector group, but we are not an arm of county government, but we work closely with many supervisors and with the county administrator, Ryan Moore, with the county tourism department and director, Joanne Conley, with the public health nursing department and director, Janelle Jones, uh, and with the Warren County Economic Development Corporation and the interim president, Jim Siplon. We are truly a private sector resource to county government to help you grow and strengthen the tourism economy and to do so safely. And I would emphasize to protect very important sources of revenue to Warren County, sales tax and occupancy tax. And our goals are set forth in the documents I think that you received prior to this meeting. But in summary, they are as follows. First, to increase total visitor spending by providing safe, healthy and memorable experiences here in Warren County. To progress toward a year round tourism economy benefiting communities countywide, to eliminate barriers and create incentives to people in our communities to find good jobs and even careers in hospitality, and to foster greater public and private collaboration and teamwork, because all of our resources are finite and we can do so much more if we leverage and work together to leverage those resources to, to greater gains for the entire community. Um, I think it's fair to say we've had some notable success uh, last summer when it appeared that Warren County might suffer a loss of as much as 50% in tourism business and in sales and occupancy tax revenues. We worked very hard to establish safety guidelines and sanitation program guidelines and a public information campaign to persuade people to wear their masks and to keep a social distance. You may have seen the signs and banners. In fact, several supervisors helped us place those banners in your communities. We focused on branding Warren County as a healthy place to visit and as a healthy place to work. And we promoted summer activities and events and worked closely with the chambers and the county tourism department to generate the wide media coverage. The work paid off. Warren County had a far better hospitality season in the summer and the fall than was originally feared and did so at that time without an increase in COVID-19 infection rates. And I have to stress, this is a team effort this is a large number of people working together weekly, trying to find a way to move the ball forward to help Warren County. And there are a lot of people who are doing a lot of good work here, but it was a true public private partnership. And I think you should be very proud of that. It was fostered by members of this board and by leaders of this board and this County. And I hope that you're proud of it. It really worked and you led the way. So while our initial focus was on saving the 2020 tourism season, our group spent a lot of time discussing the long-term opportunities and long-term challenges related to tourism. And the, and the good news there is that more people will resume travel, of course, when COVID-19 subsides, and they're seeking places with open space and healthy opportunities to get outside and places to bike and hike and fish and hunt. And Warren County is an ideal destination for all those outdoor activities year round. The challenge is that we are facing significantly increased competition and increasingly sophisticated competition, especially when it comes to, the, to visitors and those venues who lost people last year, who lost vacation revenue. Uh, they're coming back for the, to get their vacationers back. So this is another opportunity, I think, for public-private cooperation and collaboration, another opportunity to truly work together. What we find separates the merely successful tourist venues from the extraordinarily successful ones is the masterful use of data. And that's, that's central to the work that we're doing. It once was the case that you could retrospectively examine zip codes and survey guests and 
know where your visitors came from, and that's where you decided where to place your advertising for the next year. But today, the consumer's preferences and habits have changed, and they're changing rapidly. The pandemic has disrupted the old patterns. As a result, the hospitality industry is increasingly finding it necessary to collect more data more frequently and in far greater volumes, and to use that data to drive marketing decisions, not to rely on the patterns of the past, but to use new data collected frequently to drive their marketing decisions. Where we once used data to justify last year's advertising expense, today we use it prospectively to drive business. Where we once used mass market advertising to reach consumers, we now target the zip code and email address and we tailor our message to specific consumer preferences. So by using data more extensively, we see a big opportunity for Warren County to strengthen the tourism industry for the long term, to foster tourism year round, and to generate the significant sales and occupancy tax revenue that the county needs. So our request today is twofold. First, that you work with us to commission a fact-finding report that will shed light on the vacation destinations with which we compete. We wanna work collaboratively with the county, with the supervisors in the tourism department to develop the questions to be answered, to be sure this information is immediately actionable and relevant, both for the county and the private sector. It's a very natural question for you to have, what's the cost of this? We don't know yet. We haven't completed the RFP. Once we complete an issue that, we'll have a better idea of the cost. But I think there's an opportunity here for a public-private sharing of the cost. Several of, all, several of you have also asked me other good questions. Would this study repeat earlier studies done for Warren County? The answer is no. The earlier studies focused on other issues, really the internal organization of tourism and marketing. Do we have this information or most of it in hand already? The answer is no. We, have good, we need good up-to-date information on our competitors that we can use to benchmark our own performance against theirs. We wanna look at the best practices of our competitors, the best performers, and see if we can apply those practices in Warren County. And third, isn't there more benefit or other ideas that we could get out of the existing studies that have already been done? And the answer to that question is yes. We believe there is more value to be mined out of the studies that have been done over the years, and we'd like to work with the supervisors and the tourism department to examine those recommendations again and see what we could still usefully implement. So now to the second part of our request, which is not really a, a product of any kind, it's more of a process. Um, it builds on the first. We'd like to work with you on an ongoing basis in a joint effort, a collaborative effort, to collect and analyze data that we need to reach more visitors and bring them to Warren County on an ongoing basis. We have a hugely successful legacy of tourism here. It has all the natural and historical and cultural assets to be fabulously successful going forward. But we now face this greater and more sophisticated competition. Our competitors are increasingly using data to try to attract the very same visitors that we're seeking to attract. We need to work together all of us, I think, to put technology to work for Warren County. Data collection now gives us the ability to tailor our message to the specific interest of visitors. Do they come to, in the winter to ski or do more of them come to dine out? Do they want a luxury hotel or a lakeside cabin? And when are they inclined to come here? For instance, we know that our summer visitors are not our winter visitors and they have very different interests and expectations. In addition, by zip code mapping, we can see not only our traditional markets and whether they're continuing to visit Warren County, but we can also see our emerging markets, those places that are now sending more visitors to Warren County than before. And we need to understand why that is so we can keep them coming here. Last summer, for example, we discovered surprising strength in demand in the Springfield, Massachusetts market and in the corridor between Rochester and Buffalo. Very important and interesting data. The 60 miles around New York City, that remains our strongest producer of visitors. But last year, we saw a notable increase in visitors from New York, people we had not seen before in our hotels. We want to bring them back, and good data will give us the capacity to do that. We have excellent data on hotel occupancy, which tells us when to schedule events that will attract visitors, 
we can pinpoint the summer, fall, and spring weekends when a strong event could fill rooms and generate occupancy tax revenue we would otherwise not have received. My point is that our ability to compete successfully in the future will depend largely on the careful strategic use of data that inform our marketing decisions. And we believe the smart use of that data will help us foster a sustainable year-round tourism industry here, an industry that provides good jobs and career options for local people and generates revenue for business and tax revenue for the county. So the second part of our ask really is not a product, it's a process. Just joining forces with us in some informal way to help develop the data that we will all use to make tourism stronger and healthier and make Warren County more competitive. We'd like to do this work, as we say, collaboratively, jointly with the staff of the tourism department and with county supervisors sitting side by side so that we can decide together what questions are the most important, how often to survey people, how much to invest, and the knowledge we produce ought to be shared publicly so that all the parties, public and private, have ready access to it and can benefit from it. This is another opportunity, again, for the same kind of public and private partnership that delivered real benefits to the county last year. Supervisor Chair Chairwoman Sieber, I'll, I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions along with my colleagues, Sarah and Sam. And again, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you. Thank you, Mark. I, that, I know we are all very appreciative of your efforts, your group's efforts, but also the information that you just provided. And, and I was hopeful that here today we would have a chance to ask a few questions about not only your task force, but also the uh, the ask in terms of the data collection and, and certainly the process. So, at this point in time, are there questions from supervisors um, at this point? I see Supervisor Dickinson. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Mark, Mark I'm, I'm impressed uh, with your presentation and uh, have uh, followed you over the months, uh, mostly through the effort of Wild Mike. Um, I, I noticed in your presentation, though, you didn't mention the CBB or the regional chamber. Well, the regional chamber has been a part of our work right from the very beginning, uh, and it, they've done excellent work for us, and they've been a true partner, uh, especially in generating media attention and helping us get the word out in social media. Gina Mincer is a real leader and has been a great contributor to our efforts. So I, I, I should have mentioned them. You're right, uh, but they've been a great leader. Great answer. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. Sure. Thank you, Dennis. Other questions? Anyone in the boardroom? Supervisor Wild? Madam Chair, thank you very much. Can, uh, can everyone hear me so far? It doesn't work when we're in the boardroom. There you go. Um, Mark, a couple of questions. Um, one is, is the uh, impediments that you see going forward. What, um, what can we do to help with that? And secondarily, when do you think you'll have a sense about the data acquisition project? and when a request might be coming through on that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, think two, two answers to that. First, I, I'd like to work with the county, and we all would, with the tourism department and with the supervisors to finalize an RFP and go out and seek pro competitive proposals to collect that data. Um, you know, we'd like to move as quickly as possible. We think it's important to have that and to use it to inform decisions as early as this spring about uh, summer advertising and promotion. Um, in terms of impediments, I. Uh, I don't see any. I, I think there's a great willingness on the part, my sense of it is, on the part of the Board of Supervisors and the Tourism Department, the EDC, uh, the, the CBB, and the Chambers to work together. Everybody wants to work together. They see the benefits of it. Um, I know that there has been difficult relations over the years among some of these organizations, but um, I'm relatively new to this, and I don't see that. I see a great commitment to work together. People like each other and have a great respect for each other. I think the impediments, as always, are you know the amount of hours in the day and money in the bank, but um, we can find a way. And I think if there's a small group that works together on a regular basis and has the trust of the full board of supervisors, we can achieve a lot. Great, thank you. Other questions from members today? Supervisor Dickinson. Uh, it's my second one. <laughs> Um, but nobody else raised their hand. Mark, um, we, in my reign of terror, did a, a study a few years ago, and I, I was really disappointed 
in, in the study and in, in the uh, RFP, uh, it was not geared for information that I was interested in. I, I assume you're going to go for more uh, technical uh, report and give us some guidelines and wh what we should be doing and where should we should be going. That will certainly be our goal. And I, I think you're right, Dennis. Uh, you know, one of the things is we have to be careful and be very certain about the questions we ask. We want to elicit the kind of data that really is truly helpful to us and actionable. Um, we don't want a lot of qualitative, windy statements. We want some actual recommendations that can be implemented. They may, we may choose not to implement them, but we want to know what the best performers among the 10 to 20 tourism destinations that compete with Warren County, what the best performers are doing. And we want to benchmark our performance against theirs because we think there's always room for improvement. And we think if we look at what the best performers are doing, we may get some good actionable ideas. That combined with collecting data on a regular basis going forward, I think will just put Warren County much more in the driver's seat in promoting tourism for the foreseeable future. That's great. I, I'm enthusiastic. I'm uh, really pleased with where you're going with this. Thank you. I think we all are very excited about it. I know Supervisor Gary is the chair of um, Occupancy Tax and Tourism. Did you want to make any comments regarding the presentation here today, Kevin? Just to have a what they're looking for in their proposal. I think we just need to take advantage of many rules as soon as we can to get this implemented. I'm not saying we'll start it to get this information in. And we're very excited about it. Can't hear them. Can't I find it very exciting to see this go ahead. He, he did identify uh, certain criteria that they would like to see delivered in this report. So I think we can move ahead sooner rather than later with it. Supervisor Leggett, with, did, were you able to hear him okay? Yes, thumbs up, great. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Hogan has a question. I know she's on the phone line today. Is that on? Oh, there we go. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, awesome. This does work. Hi. Hi, Mark. Nice presentation. Thank you very much. I have just a couple quick questions. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the, the, the first is you mentioned a public-private sharing of cost. Uh, could you elaborate on how you envision that working out? And then the second part of my question is... Um, you know, making you, you mentioned making this data and analysis available for everyone. How do, do you have an idea of how that would work and what that would look like? Sure. Um, you know, we haven't developed uh, final ideas on this, but with respect to the cost sharing, I think we would look to those organizations in Warren County that represent uh, the private sector in the hospitality industry. And I'm thinking of the chambers and EDC and others and, and may perhaps individual contributors who would be, uh, be interested in, sh in, in sharing some of the cost. I don't imagine the cost is gonna be of such significance that uh, we would deter people, but I mean, we're gonna make a very careful analysis along with you, I hope, because I would love to have the supervisors with us in this, uh, make a careful analysis of what the benefit, the potential benefit of the data we gather is versus the cost. Um, and we wanna obviously be very careful about spending public money and as well as any private money that we might be able to collect. So I think our credibility is on the line there. Let's be sure we get a study that we can use and let's be sure we don't overpay for it. With respect to sharing it, I assume that we would do that probably in some format online so that every business in Warren County that's involved in hospitality and tourism would be able to see the ongoing data collection and benefit from that work. Um, I think that, you know, that that's really that to me is the great power in this. If we get, if we put this information in the hands of every single hospitality business, we make them all more powerful and potentially all more successful. And we do a great thing for Warren County by generating more ox in sales tax. So I, I think it's, you know, the information here is power. And we want to put it in the hands of the people who are on the front lines as soon as possible. Supervisor Hogan, does that address your questions? 
It does. It does. I I don't know if Sarah Frankenfeld is here, but I I see a little work for her on the horizon. So. <laughs> Boy, she's a gem. No. Uh, she's helped us in so many ways, as you know. And uh, she's she has a tremendous capacity for work. It's just uh, unbelievable. Well, yeah, yeah, and we're we're all just always impressed with what yeah. she creates. So, okay. absolutely, absolutely great. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for having us. I'm very, appreci very appreciative of it. Thank you, Mark. Did you, did Sarah or Sam want to weigh in at all? And I know I just saw Supervisor Bramer's hand as well. We've, we've got about eight, nine more minutes. Sarah, Sam? Uh, we'll let we'll the supervisor go first, if that's okay. Ms. Bramer? Supervisor Bramer. Thank you, Chairwoman. Hi, Mark. Thanks for everything. I know I haven't been able to get on all of the hospitality calls, but whenever I do, I'm very impressed with you guys working together, which is really neat to see. Um, I guess from my sitting in my supervisor seat, uh, I do worry about the cost on the county sure. for for something that, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I looked at your responses and what you said tonight, today that we already we don't have anything exactly like this going out and trying to get best practices from other areas. So I think, I think that's something we should always be striving to look and see how we can improve on what we're already doing and make it a little bit better. So that's something I'm definitely interested, but like supervisor Hogan said, what about this cost sharing and what went through my mind is the County does provide funding to the CVB. So that might be a way that um, if they've got any funds left over from 2020, I know that not everyone was able to do the events. They weren't always able to go on trainings or, or um, I'm sorry, they're um, go to those conventions. Maybe they've got a little money squirreled away that the county provided to them that they could use towards this uh, this project. Yeah, I, 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 Claudia, I, I agree with you. I, I don't want to speak for those organizations. I, I'm not, uh, you know, affiliated with them, but um, I think there will be an interest on the part of, of several different organizations in contributing in some way toward this work because I think it's work that we can really build on, and there should be a public-private sharing because it's truly a public-private partnership. Oh, and and on the sharing of the data, I. I love your idea about being able to get it out to people. I don't know if that's the best idea for us to put it on the website because like we heard from the our ad consultant last week, they don't want to share that information. Yeah. So do yeah. we necessarily want to put it out there for anybody like from Pennsylvania or New Jersey or wherever to go, oh, let's just go to the Warren County website and steal their, <laughs> steal yeah. the information that they paid to get. You know, you know the the uh, competitive advantage is we get by collecting the information. They they exist for a very short time. So even if we if we post it on the web or not post it on the web, they'll they'll still figure out our game uh, in in rather short order. Um, okay, fine. You know, um, but what I, I'll tell you, one thing we did do last uh, I don't know, I'll forget the last summer I guess it was um, after the summer season is we had a big meeting of the hospitality industry and shared the best data we had at that point about where the summer visitors had come from, all hands, a, you know, a wide open invitation, uh, come and listen to it and listen to the presentations. And we made those presentations available, obviously to the county and to any business that asked for it. Um, I think that getting the information is, is important, but getting the information out is even more important. And we, we, really, we really have to empower these businesses to, to do all the things they need to do to be more competitive. Um, How exciting that we have so many questions too. And just to, so you're aware, I, I saw Supervisor Wild and Supervisor Dickinson and I think Supervisor Driscoll. Um, I think he, he had a question, but I might be wrong. Uh, Supervisor Wild. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Mark, and if this is maybe more from Sarah, you can, but the information that you're looking for is data. It's not, in my mind, it's not necessarily someone that's going to give us a strategic action plan. It's data and information that we can draw our own plans from. So I'm, I'm wondering if that clarification, or if you can clarify whether that's really what we're trying to do. And yes. Compares with the other studies. Yes, Mike, that's right. I mean, I, I think our view has been that we need data. Uh, we can decide what to do with that data, how to form plans around it. The people on the hospitality communications group, and I, I'm not talking about myself, the people in the industry on the hospitality communications group are experts in tourism. They know what to do with the data. They know how to use it. They know how to interpret it, and they can put it to the most uh, the most valuable use. I don't think we need um, an outside expert to tell us 
you know, what the strategy should be. The strategy should grow out of the people in Warren County. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Dickinson and Supervisor Driscoll. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, this is three for you now, Dennis. Three, yeah, I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> I, I'm, getting, I'm getting as bad as Wild Mike. Um, I just wanted to comment about the, the funding. The uh, occupancy tax has more than enough money to fund it. And one of the things we as a county need to do is stop stealing OC tax from other people. You know, they, they make requests for money and they get that money. They ha already have a program for it. We need to look at the money that we have. And we have enough money to do this. We have more than enough money to do this project, but we need to do it internally, not, not borrow it from somebody else. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Dickinson. What I hear you say is sharing our resources should be a priority. Supervisor Driscoll. <laughs> thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, and, and thanks, Mark, and the entire uh, team. As you know, Warren County is a, uh, a team of 12 un different municipalities, and each has um, uh, reason uh, to, uh, to want to bring people to their communities and, and successfully do that, uh, some on a much smaller scale. Um, I, I just want to uh, make sure, and I'm certain of, of your response, that, uh, that each of the uh, municipalities within Warren County are, are being looked at with your uh, data collection, and, and we'll all have kind of a, uh, a stake in, in your venture. Absolutely, Ben. I, and I think that's a very, very important point that all the work that we do should and has to benefit communities countywide. And, you know, and we can't hope to have a year round tourism season in Warren County unless we pay attention to what's going on in North Creek and what's going on in Glens Falls and what's going on in Chester and what's going on in Lake Luzerne, as well as the traditional tourism areas, the Boltons and the Lake Georges. We have to use every asset at our disposal to develop a 12 month a year tourism economy. It's essential. It won't work without it. So um, we want to be sure that we're, we're, you know, for instance, we're looking at, at uh, you know, like Octax events, uh, you know, using those events at times of the year and in places where we need them. We need the business. We can generate more business. So I think every bit of our work is focused on a countywide perspective. Well, thank you. Everyone had excellent questions, and we certainly appreciate the information you have given to us today, uh, both Sarah and Sam, and I'm sorry we were out of time in terms of our presentation and, and or your presentation that you're sharing with us today. But what I have taken away from this, and I correct me if I'm wrong, Supervisor Garrity, is that we will soon see this at your committee. And our committees uh, meet, as you know, you have that annual calendar. Amanda can, can get you that as well. Uh, at the, towards the end of February um, after a board meeting. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, again, you know, I could thank, uh, I know a hundred different people on this call and different members of our board. So please take this as a big thank you and uh, certainly enjoy the communication, the collaboration and prioritizing Team Warren County. So um, with that, we are moving on to our rules of the board training and you are more than welcome to stay. <laughs> You're find it. <laughs> thank you very much. A sincere thank you to all of you. Good luck. Thank, thank you. you. At this point in time, I'd like to turn uh, our workshop over to both Mary Costain and Amanda Allen. They've worked very hard uh, to come up with a PowerPoint presentation and have also sent you a copy of the rules of the board. From time to time, it's always good to take a look at these items uh, so that we're all on the same page. I would encourage you to ask questions if it's okay with both of them as we go so that we aren't um, backtracking. Uh, but I also would like you to know that uh, Supervisor Beatty, who's Chair of Governmental Operations and Advocacy, uh, will be putting this topic on his task or on his committee towards the end of the year, at the end of the year, but August, September, to look at uh, all of our feedback in terms of how we can change the rules of the board if there are concerns. And now we'll be really well informed about what some of those ideas might be moving forward. So please keep that wish list of things you'd like to talk about throughout those discussions with his committee later in the year. Uh, and our hope is also, while there are a few areas that we are gonna talk about as it relates to Robert's rules, it's only as it relates to the rules of the board. So we are in the works of, of getting that next training set up uh, as it relates to Robert's rules. But first things first, and uh, you know, Mary and Amanda, 
thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing from you. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? First off, tell me if you cannot. Everyone on Zoom, can you hear me okay? Craig, no. I would say, Mary, just if you, yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Uh, Hammy, can you share my screen? Yeah. Oh. You should be able to share your screen, yeah? All right, welcome to the exciting part of the night. Um, we're going to discuss the Warren County Board of Supervisors rules for 2021. Um, they are passed in resolution number six of 2021. Can everyone still hear me okay? It's a little cloudy, but I can hear you. Okay. Um, all right, so first we're going to discuss the meeting of the Board of Supervisors. When are the meetings generally held for the Board of Supervisors? No, Kevin, go ahead. Can you answer that? Well, we hold them on Friday. Third Friday of the month. There you go. Third Friday. Exactly right. So meetings are generally held the third Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Except for, does anyone know what the wild card meeting is? Yeah. June, do you know the date? Uh, I think it was June 16th. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, June 16th, 2021, the meeting is scheduled to be held at 4 p.m. I'm going to let Amanda take this next one. Uh, we are anticipating an evening meeting for the 2022 budget presentation that's on the calendars that I sent out to you. So that's tentatively set for November 3rd at 4 p.m. But that's not officially set until set until you get the letter from the chair setting a special board meeting, which you won't get until probably October. Which of course, Frank has to agree with. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the uh, workshops, uh, which we're having tonight, uh, those are scheduled at the discretion of the chair, but no more than bi-monthly. We currently have those on the tentative calendars that I sent out to you. They're scheduled for 4 p.m., not to exceed two hours, and they're set for today, February 3rd, April 7th, and September 1st. We didn't schedule them for June because you already have a night meeting scheduled then, and then in November, we're planning on a night meeting. So those ones we haven't scheduled any meetings. All right, and while we're talking about meetings, I do just want to go over meeting notices. Um, so the law states that if a meeting is scheduled at least one week in advance of the meeting, the meeting notice must be given to the news, posted on the county website, and posted in a public location at least 72 hours before the meeting. If the meeting is scheduled less than a week in advance, and we only do this in emergency circumstances, um, not a practice of our board. Um, the notice must be sent to the news, posted to the website, and posted publicly, and I quote, a reasonable time prior thereto. Um, and of course, the legal test for this is arbitrary and capricious. So if the board has a reasonable reason to have this meeting on an emergency basis, it should stand out to an Article 78 in court. <coughs> We have a question from Supervisor Gary. Yeah. So the 72 hour uh, rule doesn't, is it effect for every meeting, whether it's emergency or not? We, our practice is that every meeting is scheduled with 72 hours notice. Right. Unless there's some real 
huge emergency that we can't meet 72 hours, we don't do that. But our practice is 72 hours. But a board can have an emergency meeting. Good. And, but you still have to get it out to the media. So that's right. But you have that's, to have a good reason to be yeah. doing emergency. Oh, yeah. I'm a good reason. <laughs> I, I, I learned something. All right. And this might be important information for all of you. How is a regular meeting adjourned? Do you know the answer to this one? And, you know, during this time, feel free to, to jump on in and ask your questions or answer these fun questions because I, I cannot see if anyone's raising their hands. My the chairman? Um, <laughs> no. So a meeting is adjourned by a majority of the members funded, not by a majority of the members on the board. It's a majority of the members funded at the meeting. Does that require a vote or a consensus? Motion adopted. Okay, thanks. But not before. Wasn't there a trick part of that? But not before consulting with your county attorney, county, you know, I'm wrong. I'm getting deductions. Never mind. Okay. okay. I'm all excited. I know. Sorry. All right. So how are special meetings called? Does anyone want to take this or do you want me to just answer? Okay. They can be called by the chair or the vice chair if the chair is absent, unable, or incapacitated. A written request for a special meeting signed by a by a majority of the total membership of the board, a written notice stating time, place, and purpose must be delivered at least 48 hours in advance of the meeting unless the members leave that service requirement. Ryan Moore has questions. Yes, I have a question. This is something that I have been asked before and I have not known the answer. When we say a uh, majority of the membership of the board, does that mean 11 out of 20 or does that mean a majority of the weighted vote? That means 501 of the weighted vote. Thank you. Oh. Transaction of business, which, which also means the priority of business, and you just screenshotted the agenda that in the rules right out of the slide for you. Um, so it says business shall be transacted in the following order. Um, I think most of you know this, but when the word shall is used, it's a requirement. Um, if it's may or should, it means you can do it that way, but you don't have to. Um, because the rules of the board lay out the order of business and uses the word shall, if anyone wants to take business out of this order, a motion has to be made, one, to waive the rules, and then another motion needs to be made to change the order of business. Um, in order to waive the rules under section E2 of the rules of the board, two-thirds vote is needed. That's 667 weighted votes of the board of supervisors. And then the second, the second motion, which is just to change the order and put it in whatever order you want, that's just the majority. So that's 501. Ryan, if you want to take the um, notes. Sure. So um, just a couple of notes on the um, business. So the salute to the flag, that one, that, as you know, that rotates monthly um, around the horn here. And whoever leads the pledge is also the first person to vote on resolutions. Um, down further, you'll see reports of committee chair or reports by committee chairs. Those are that's the time when reports should only be made, made by committee chairs. And those um, I'm told are going to proceed proceeding from now on in alphabetical order down the standing committees list. And then all non committee chair reports, um, everyone's given the opportunity to speak and you know report on what they've been doing. That's going to be done during the privilege of the floor public comments. And just a note on the committee report, Robert's rules state that they should only be made when there's business to report or recommendations to be made as a result of a committee meeting. Any report made to the Board of Supervisors must contain a committee's findings, the result of its actions in carrying out the task assigned to it, and its recommendations. Just keep that in mind when you're making your report. Uh, question, Supervisor Gary. Yeah. Repeat that. 
uh, Robert's rules say that um, any report made to the Board of Supervisors must contain the committee's findings, the results of any of its actions in carrying out the tasks assigned to it, and its recommendations. Can I stop you? Okay, so say we have uh, 23 resolutions out of committee. You mean to tell me the chairman's got to recite those 23 resolutions in his committee report? Uh, according to Robert's rules, yes, and that's why you're supposed to do every committee report in writing. Oh, my. Might be something that you want to put on that wish list for Paul, Supervisor Garrity. Well, I hope Mr. Beatty's listening. They are, I mean, it's bad enough that people repeat what's in our agenda, but I guess we're supposed <laughs> to repeat those resolutions. And can't the written report just be the list of resolutions that are on for consideration through that committee? I would say that the list could be the resolutions that you're recommending to be passed by the Board of Supervisors. Because your recommendation would be, I would assume, if it comes out of committee to pass those re uh, resolutions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Supervisor Garrity? Well, really quick. I mean, Okay, so in the past, and I understand we're living in the past, although we did hear a good presentation about this, we never, we never, people didn't sit there and read resolution one, two, three, four, five, four, five. To, the, to the board members because you had a copy of those resolutions in your packet, which we were supposed to look at before you ever came to the board meeting, but that happens rarely, you know. So, but now what I'm hearing you say is the committee chair, but you're going to go alphabetically, but you're really going to screw people up because the B, C, D, I don't know how we you can go right down the list. Okay, but, but I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to be difficult, but man, the B's are long enough, but you start reading off every resolution and the number, and we have resolution for this, 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 and this, which some of my colleagues do already, which is fine. It's going to uh, belabor or make our meetings a lot longer than they are currently if we follow the rules as stated, right? Am I right or wrong? I just ate them. Supervisor Garrett, I think you're bringing up a good point where we can still follow the rules, but have that, um, whether that be a Mary or Amanda answer here, I think there's definitely a way to address it. I have a quick question, Mary. Would the resolution index, which lists all of the resolution titles and their numbers, would that count as a report? It lists the committee what's approved. Yeah, the way that I read Robert's rules is the committee is there and supposed to be a written report to be able to take it over to the committee to see if the form that it's currently to you. Um, but I would say the good news is that Robert's rules says to not follow it and it's going to make your process harder. So this might be something that you want to discuss with the board and decide that that process is harder for you than what you have for mandatory. But I put that up to the board in general. That's not my fault. I mean, I'm, a, I'm not prepared for reading the resolution number and what it entails. So some people were astounded. We could be here until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I, I think to your point, Supervisor Garrity, we all need to be mindful of the limited time that we have during those meetings. Ben Driscoll, Supervisor Driscoll, had, I, I now have my phone up and running to read your chats so you can put those questions in there as well. Um, he had asked, can we also use the committee report time to inform or remind committee members of the date and time of the next meeting or some important matters that or issues that would be discussed at the meeting? He's talking about no more than 30 seconds. So. Mary, is it reasonable to say that someone could refer to the resolution packet with the resolution numbers in front of them? We've certainly made that information public, but also highlight those important aspects of their committee meeting in a very brief summary as a committee chair. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think that should address your concerns, Supervisor Garrity, should answer Supervisor Driscoll's concerns. And then again, the standing committees would be called... Um, you know, based on, on our list, our chairs would give their report. And then certainly we have our time 
for privilege of the floor and announcements where both were asking for um, information from other supervisors that may not have fallen into that specific time for report by committee chair. Does that make sense? Yeah, Supervisor Moore, Supervisor Moore. County Administrator Moore. Thank you, and does that mean that the content of the report has to be limited to those things that the, the committee chair can't go on and do something that doesn't have anything to do with the work of the committee? Right. Okay, thank you. All right. So that's an important distinction. Did you want to say that one more time? My, my question was whether that, whether uh, the, the piece that Mary read is the only thing that's proper to do in a committee report or whether it's permissible for a supervisor in a committee report to go off on a different topic that is not related to the work of that committee. And the answer is uh, that yes, that the report is limited to uh, pieces that have to do with the committee. Very good. Thank you, Supervisor Wild. Thank you. I just want a question about the written report. Is that something that will be in our packet? So it's more information about the decisions that were made and how they were made. Yeah. I think that's up to the board. I mean, as of right now, you do not do written reports from the committee. Robert's rules says that that's what is appropriate. So I think it's up to the board whether or not you want to follow the written report or if you want to keep doing it morally like we've been doing. I think the rules of the board, it's not speaking to that aspect. So that's more of a Robert's rules aspect. So I think the way we're doing it right now is within accordance um, of our rules of the board, unless I'm misinterpreting what Mary is saying. Our rules don't address it. The rules don't address it. So certainly Supervisor Wild, I, I suppose any member could submit a written report about their committee as well if they choose to. No, I was more curious about the committee chair. Right. Basically expanding our minutes. Right, so we're going through each, each and every resolution with a brief summary of why it's there and you know the decision, how the decision was made. It seems like that's that's what Robert's rules is saying to document this and formalize that documentation instead of it just being kind of video somewhere. Right, I think the good news is that our committee minutes are produced after you know each one of our meetings as committee chairs and then you, you may notice at the meetings you some of us have to print out you know of what took place during that time but it's all made part of the public record as well so that might be sufficient um but we could also add to it this is one of those areas that in the fall i think we need to address it and when we're looking at rules of the board if we want to make it uh you know more restrictive than, than how it is I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but I'm going to hit it over to Amanda and Mary. I, you know, I don't really chair a committee now, so I, I hate to impose my thoughts on all those other chairs, but it, it is something that I would find side for the work. And the public might find side for the work. Well, I think because our rules don't uh, require it, yeah, it doesn't speak to it in the rules of the board that again is something that we should put on that list to be talking about uh, with governmental operations but certainly any member is more than welcome to submit that written report as well and in fact supervisor wild that's one of the things that i hope to do so I don't you know take up a ridiculous amount of time telling you about the month uh su supervisor thomas okay mm-hmm So I think what we're hearing today is we want to stick to our committee reports, make sure that if there are other items that we'd like to be talking about, that that's done during the proper sections of the meeting. Okay. And that certainly we can be submitting those written reports as well as a traditional <laughs> supplemental to speed things along and provide notice to the public. Is that what I hear you saying, Supervisor Tom? <laughs> <laughs> who, who, uh, who, who's gonna? So I can write a one-page report on my resolution. Nope, there's nothing that says that I gotta go into too much detail. And then, of course, so I'm going down to the committee and it says that's all I gotta do. It's basically what your summary says anyway. Whereas you're aware of the result of that. So I can write a report. A one liner that says, it, which you know, we used to write it when we were chairman, we wrote a report, and we would have 
where we are attending. attending. So that could be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be a book from my to read it. That would feel good about it, right? Okay. You really want to see what you Next topic. Okay. Resolution. Um, when does a resolution need a waiving of the rules? And again, just to go over this, if you're going to waive the rules, you need 667 votes of the board, not the two third majority vote. So you need to waive the rules when the resolution isn't in writing, which means the supervisor is bringing that resolution from the floor at the board meeting. If the resolution is not approved at a committee, approved at a committee, but not filed with the clerk of the board before noon, the Tuesday before the regular Friday board meeting, not distributed and posted on the website by the clerk of the board the Tuesday before the regular board meeting. So it has to go through a committee, be turned in to Amanda before noon on Tuesday before the board meeting, and also distributed to the board that same Tuesday before the board meeting. And then if the resolution is not sent out three days prior to a special board meeting. Questions on that one? Anyone on Zoom with questions on that? Ah, good. All right, proper use of the motion to table. Does anyone want to take a stab at this one? Where's that? Uh, you can win a Robert's Rules yeah. Club. All right, so the appropriate use of the motion to table is when the board would like to lay aside the resolution that's currently in front of them for an item that they feel is more important. A perfect example of this is the personnel meeting that took place on December 3rd, 2020. I had asked for an executive session to discuss litigation. Um, ben Driscoll thought it more important, um, rightly so, to hear from Janelle from Public Health before I went into executive session. So that was the appropriate time to make a motion to table to hear from Janelle and then come back to my motion um, to go to the executive session. Right. Once a motion um, is made to table something, does anyone know how many votes it takes to keep that off the table? 501 votes, just a simple majority of the board. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, Supervisor Molino. So once something's tabled, we're all supposed to be brought back up and somebody else in second get back up, right? That's the way I'll do it. Yeah, and then so you need just can't change the one that's over with, move on with something else. Somebody can sure. yep. put it up again and get a second, and it's back on the board. Yep. And I don't think you can table it again. I'm not. Yeah, I think that's the way it so it's a motion, a second, and then 501 votes of our board. Put it back on. Correct. Put it back on the agenda. Right. Yeah. Supervisor Marlena, one of uh, Robert's rules book. I don't know. Yeah, see? Surprise. I didn't read that. I didn't read that. I didn't read that. was good. Thank you. That was a good question. Supervisor Thomas. Such a good question. Mary. Yep. So our rules do allow you to stop the date with a motion to table. Um, that is in our rules specifically, and our rules trump Robert's rules. It is on my wish list to discuss this fall, Supervisor Thomas. <laughs> but that that is a very big distinction. And I think one that Mary spent a lot of time on to make sure that you know we understood our rules are more restrictive in particular areas. And that is one of them. Right. 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 So yeah, with, with, this, with this great book of Robert's rules that we have, um, do we know which ones are overridden by our local law? So I can kind of mark up my table of contents and disregard. Yeah. Um, so we know a couple of them. I will not claim to know each of them. The book is very thick. Um, but yeah. as we come across them, I do mark them. I think that's a very good point, though, and it's one we've been talking about. So I know that Mary's keeping a list of that moving forward uh, with Amanda as well in terms of when we do our rappers training, but also in talking about looking at 
are we too restrictive in particular areas or not restrictive enough? And what is the will of the board come, you know, a, a workshop and discussion on that? So um, maybe Mary, as you start to identify those, we could do periodic updates out to the board on what that is. Sure. And uh, I'm happy to get, a, get you a highlighter and our supervisor while too. Mine's working overtime. Okay. All right, so moving on to duties, responsibilities of the chair of the board of supervisors, which we're talking about the chair of the board, not the chair of the lead committee right now. So the duties of the chair of the board are to preserve order and decide all questions of work. Um, this essentially serves as a parliamentarian of the board. The board can appeal a chair's ruling and to do so, a motion needs to be made to appeal the ruling of the chair. It does need a second. And the motion is voted on to determine whether to sustain or overrule the rule. A majority vote in the negative overturns the decision of the chair. The chair of the Board of Supervisors does vote, and this is different than a chair of a committee. The chair of a committee does not have the right to vote unless there is a tie, and the vote of the chair of the committee will break the tie in the affirmative. The chair controls speaking of the members. Members shall address the chair and cannot proceed until recognized by the chair. No member shall speak more than once on any question until every member has had a right to speak. While speaking, no other member shall entertain any private discourse or pass between them or the chair, which basically means having a private conversation between you and another member or you and the chair. No debate shall be in order until the pending question is restated by the chair or read by the clerk. Um, so basically this means someone makes a motion, the chair either does the motion back to the board or Amanda would say the motion back to the board so I need to have discussion on it. If the chair or chair of the committee wishes to enter into debate, they can only do so after they excuse themselves from the chair and appoint a temporary chair that can be any member of the board. Any member being called to order shall remain in their seat until the point raised is determined. If the point is sustained, they shall not proceed except in order, unless by permission. Mary, may I ask a, just to clarify, this would be one of those situations where our rules are more strict than Robert's rules. So while Robert's rules allows every member to speak twice and has a recommendation of 10 minutes max, we don't have a limit on the amount of time unless voted by the board, and we only allow once um, before uh, technically from our rules of the board. So we are more restrictive. So our rules just say, our rules don't limit the amount of time that you can speak. The only thing that our rules say is that once you speak, if other members want to speak, they have to speak before you, but then you can go back to that member Robert's rules cuts off discussion at two comments per motion. Our rules do not have that limitation. Um, in Robert's rules, you don't have to make a motion to allow someone to speak more than twice. So we do not have a limitation. You do not. Okay. Supervisor Gary. But in the chair and the limit, the amount of uh, discussion and an enlargement, I mean, yeah, so the chairman can make a ruling on the rules. So if the chair wants to limit discussion, she can. If someone doesn't want that limitation, that's the perfect example of appealing her determination. And then the board would have to vote whether or not to allow discussion to continue. Okay, thank you. Motions and resolutions. Um, all motions and resolutions are presented in open regular meetings. The chair will state what committee that a motion or resolution will be referred to unless objected to by the board and then the board would decide. A motion to adjourn shall always be in order and decided without debate, provided the county administrator and county attorney 
had the opportunity to inform the board of operation or legal consequences under the what the chair was right. This is one of those situations where um, it is ended without debate unless Ryan or I have some legal or procedural consequence to end it now. If a question is under debate, the only motions that can be made are for an adjournment of the board, motion to table indefinitely, to place on the table for a certain day, to hold, and to amend. The order in which these motions are made above are the order of precedence that they take. And none of them are subject to debate, provided that Ryan or myself have the opportunity to inform you of any operation or operational or legal consequences. Mary, can I ask a question for Supervisor Driscoll? There are times when a member asks a question and is not satisfied with the chair's response. If they re-ask and clarify their questions, does this count as two questions? Um, it's not two different questions, but the chair has the authority to either stop them from asking again or to allow them to. Um, it's not two different questions. Supervisor Driscoll, does that answer your question or? Yes, thank you. Next are special committees. They're authorized to any legal meeting of the board. They are appointed by the chair unless ordered and directed by a majority of the board. And the time period to serve shall be designated when they're created. Standing committees um, are at least three members and are appointed by the chair at the organization meeting or before the first regular meeting following the organizational meeting. Um, and I, again, copy and pasted the committees that were in our rules and put them right up on the slide for you along with the members. Um, I think Amanda's going to explain the executive committee. So the executive committee, that's something that's brand new to us this year. Um, this is an attempt to stop from having special meetings before the board something comes up. We have usually a pretty decent gap between the end of committees and when the board meetings held. It's not unusual for something weird to pop crop up, and we it may take approvals from two or three committees instead of just one. So the executive committee is intended to cover for every committee. It it does have a large membership. Um, it says 13 members here, but that was a error on my part. We'll be fixing that because I forgot to include the special committees. So that's going to increase to 14 members. That's all of the committee chairs. So that way, no matter what committee something's coming from, that chair has an opportunity to represent whatever's going on. Um, also, the chairmanship for the executive committee is going to essentially rotate. Um, you do have to have a designated chair of the committee, um, but what's going to happen is uh, Mr. Beatty is the chair for that committee, so he's going to come in and defer to the next person in rotation. So essentially, every member will chair that committee at some point. Um, but this, this just gave us an opportunity to have other committees meet, plus it's a set day on your schedule. So instead of having, you know, maybe the Wednesday before we're having a special public safety and then we're having a maybe finance on Thursday, it's going to be one day and it's already preset on the calendar. So we won't be jumping all over. It's just trying to organize things better and um, try and stop you from having surprise meetings and things. Not to say that they might not still happen anyway, but this is our best shot at trying to reduce those. Oh, also, Public Works on here says that it has five members. We are amending the rules of the board at the February board meeting because we're adding two more members to um, Public Works. And, you know, the cat that I initially, when, when Amanda brought this up, we were calling it the catch all committee, but that didn't sound very, you know, formal on our meeting. List. So are there questions at all about our catch-all or executive committee? I know that there, there have been discussions. Hopefully those member updates are helpful in explaining it. 
uh, super, oh my, what do I keep doing? Administrator Moore. I think it's a great concept in order to help us uh, catch something that there would otherwise, as has been stated, require scheduling uh, additional committee meetings. Um, there's inevitably something that comes up late that was unforeseen. My question is if, if a, an item goes through the executive committee that would typically be required to go through personnel or through finance, do, do, does it still then subsequently have to go through one or the other of those committees or can the executive committee take on that, that, that responsibility? I, I think the executive committee is envisioned vision to cover for those. Um, but now that you mentioned that, we should look at the rules of the board and make sure since we're readapting those um, to address the committee membership, that's something we should brush up on too, just okay. to make sure that it says definitively there that executive committee will have authority to approve basically anything. Okay, okay. thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Chairwoman. Yes, of course, Supervisor Bruno, I think. Or is it McGowan? I'm sorry. McGowan. Supervisor McGowan. Thank you. Uh, no, that worked out nice because I was, uh, when I was talking to one of my departments today and on uh, future agendas and goals uh, set for the year. Um, he needed a, a, a placement, um, and actually, uh, I think Ryan was hopefully got it today. Supervisor McGowan, you froze. Yeah. <laughs> but can you hear me? <laughs> okay, you're back on. All right. Um, so it worked out nice that I said, well, we have this, we have a new executive committee that if you need to get it in before the board meeting, um, we can go through that if you miss it on the committee. So he was happy to hear that because it, it just, uh, just in case the last minute. So I think it's a, uh, it's a great committee to put together for, like I said, uh, it's a nice thing to call it the catch all, but I like uh, executive committee better. So thank you. Other questions? Okay, so uh, a little known fact about committees. I feel like this one was uh, new to me, so I feel like it might be new to you guys. Um, committees seeking to obtain a right of way in a particular municipality or acting on a matter affecting a single municipality, the supervisor of the affected municipality shall have the opportunity to make a presentation. Something for all of you non supervisors to keep in mind. Um, the members of the committee, the first member appointed shall act as chair. Chair appoints vice chair and second vice chair, who shall serve as the chair, vice chair, and captain. Vice chair and second vice chair designations are submitted to the clerk of the board before the date of the first regular board meeting. Meetings of the committee are called by the chair. Voting a committee is a one person, one vote basis. And again, the chair of the committee is not allowed to vote unless that vote is to break a tie in the affirmative, which means that the motion would pass. I think that's something, Mary, that we really want to highlight because we've, you know, at committees, many times we hear committee chairs engage in debate and vote. Um, so we really want to be careful about abiding by the rules of the board as it relates to that. Uh, so are there questions on this? Because that, in practice, I know sometimes we get away from it. Awesome. Yeah, and that's a really important point that I didn't hit on. It is improper for a chair of either committee or the board to engage in debate. They are to be an unbiased member who is just supposed to steer the committee through the committee process. Supervisor Molino and then Supervisor McGowan. Yes, yeah, so you would step down and you would get to appoint the person that takes the chair for you. Correct. Uh, Supervisor McGowan. Uh, thank you. So uh, our standing committees that we have now. I always look at the, the the person behind the the chair as the vice chair. So um, I just thought it was preset. So um, do I need to appoint uh, my vice chair for my committee? So the rules say that you were to pick the vice chair before the first regular <laughs> board meeting. 
So right. I'm assuming that happens. <laughs> I thought I thought we assigned the vice chairs. The the number two person is the vice chair. Um, I know the year before, Supervisor Thomas had the chairs uh, decide on the vice chair, but I thought this year we changed it. And maybe that changed. Did that go through? Uh, so it's a pair of points vice chair and second vice chair. And I'm wondering if that means right. the chair of the board. So, so does that mean I just need to confirm that I agree with uh, my second in line as my vice chair? No, it, it means that I've already appointed your vice chairs. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, you can change it in the rules of the board for next year. Of course. No, no, no. Um, but yeah, so when you step aside to engage in debate, it doesn't have to be your vice chair that you appoint to come up so you can be engaged in debate. I will state though that Robert's rules, and we'll, we'll have that training later on, does really discourage that. They don't get too excited over the, having the chair remove uh, themselves to engage into debate. Uh, and, and there's lots of reasons for that, but um, for a different time. But regardless, yeah, your vice chair is, is your number two person. Is that correct, Mary? That's good. Yeah. Okay. A good question. Okay, uh, so the chair of the Board of Supervisors acts as an ex officio member um, at committee meetings if a quorum is not present, if such membership of the chair would provide a quorum, and the chair is available to attend. The chair of the board is considered an alternate or substitute for the non-present committee member, so it doesn't increase the number of the committee, it keeps it the same, it just takes the place of one of the members. And again, uh, we have this again on the slide, the committee chair is unable to participate in debate from the chair. If the opportunity to engage in debate is desired, the chair must be turned over to another committee member before engaging. And just a uh, question for the people here. Can the vice chair of the board fill the duties of the chair if they are absent? Yeah. The vice chair of the board? And fill the duties of the chair if the chair is absent. So what I mean by that is yeah. they can become an ex officio member and they can make the forum. Mm -hmm. yeah. According to our rules. This is my favorite slide tonight. Uh, Supervisor Thomas, did you have a question? No. Oh, uh, no. Did you know that? Our woman, I did. That's, that's good to know. Good catch, Mary. Uh, Supervisor Leggett. Uh, thank you. I agree on uh, that previous slide. In regards to the chairman being in the debate, the chairman can facilitate the discussion, ask questions, and be involved in those means, correct? Yes, that's the point of the chair. Correct. Okay. But actually, arguing a point one way or another is not appropriate for the chair? Is that what we're saying? Could you, could you Ask your question one more time, Supervisor Leggett. I think we both heard it differently. Okay. No, uh, she answered it the way I'd like to hear it answered. <laughs> uh, a chair has a role, so they are not totally silent when something is on the floor. Uh, they do participate in what is being said by asking questions or uh, engaging in the discussion one way or another. I think there's a distinction between what is considered a debate and what is facilitating a discussion. So the duty of the chair is to facilitate discussion. They're supposed to be unbiased. So I would say if your question raises some sort of bias or is going to steer the debate in some way, I wouldn't ask it. Um, the point I think of the chair is to just facilitate all the discussion around the issue not to steer it in a certain direction. Thank you. You guys could have got rid of me way sooner. Uh, <laughs> it is frustrating to know that, you know, I hear what you're saying, Craig, that it, you're only facilitating and you're not weighing in the debate unless you're stepping down to have that. And I know from talking with prior chairs, that is a limitation that, um, you know, Supervisor Thomas had mentioned to me, you know, it's, it's nice to now be able, you know, keep, I think you'll hear him be very vocal uh, or more vocal or however you want to look at it, but it is a limitation. And our committee chairs need to be aware of that because you're bound by the same rules. Right, Aaron? Right. 
So any other questions about that? We're good. Okay. Rachel. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, hello. Supervisor Schaub, and then Supervisor Dickinson. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to go back to what uh, Supervisor McGowan was saying, because I'm reading the rules. No, I'll just turn it on. It says that um, the chair appoints the vice chair. That's what it says. Well, I, the problem with the sound system is uh, those people that are not at that meeting, the, the sound is terrible. But all I can do is read you the slide that was presented to us a minute ago. It says, the chair appoints vice chair, right there. Right there, second bullet down under members. Right, Supervisor Stiles, so Mary, what page under the rules of the board, resolution six of 2021? Paragraph three. Listen, I can't hear you, but I can read. And what I'm reading is the chair appoints the vice chair. Okay. Does it say chair of committee or chair of board, Supervisor Straub? It's talking about the chair of the committee. Okay, so that's a very valid point. And I think that then what we need to do is uh, ask that within the next seven days, every chair of your committees please uh, notify Amanda who's accepted the role of your vice chair and we can very easily make that correction for our February meeting. Well, uh, good. Okay. Brad, you were right. Yeah, good, good point. And I'm glad you guys caught that. I know um, we did this within the six days we had and uh, tried to do the best, but when there's errors, we should correct them. Absolutely. Uh, so let's, let's get that fixed. Mary, is, are you understanding that to be correct? Okay, we'll get that fixed. Thank you, Supervisor Stroud, Supervisor McGowan. Jeez. Supervisor Dickinson, uh, you had a question. I, I do, uh, Chairman. Uh, could you go back to that slide you were on? What one? I don't know which one you were on. It was about debate by the committee chair. I, 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 are you kidding? <laughs> Mary? Supervisor Dickinson uh, would like a little more explanation on debate by committee chair. I'll, I'll let him ask his question again. Well, I, I, the, the chair's part of the committee. I, 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 I'm dumbfounded that he can't participate in the debate. Mayor. Um, so our rules and Robert's rules state that if you want to participate in the debate, you just have to step down from the chair and you can appoint someone to take your position. You can leave the chair, debate, and then come back to the chair. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, I don't agree with it at all. There's no, reason, there's no reason why we can't change it. I, I, I don't agree with it. We got some committees only have five members, including the chair. As Supervisor Dickinson, I think to your point, that's why we want to get this work group going throughout the year to make these changes and suggestions to be voted on by the full board. Well, my suggestion is that we allow the chair of the debate. I don't see why it should be uh, taken out of it. I don't think the chair should badger the, the committee, if that's the right word. But the, uh, he, he, he should control the, the meeting, but he should be allowed to express his opinions and, and debate an issue. Some, sometimes the chair is much more uh, uh, involved and informed than, than the committee. And I, I think Robert's rules does speak to informal dialogue and committees where you have 12 members or less. But again, that's that's not what our rules of the board have historically said. And so that's why we're doing this training. But again, I defer to Mary as, as you guys have identified, you know, there are, we wanna make sure we're following the rules. I, uh, the, I, mean, I, 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 I don't have any problem with not filing the rules as long as everybody agrees to it. <laughs> And I, I, I think the chair should be allowed to, to enter in the debate or discussion. 
I mean, I don't know what you consider a debate to be, but you should, certainly should be able to participate in the discussion. Usually, I, again, tonight we are not taking any type of action, so that's certainly something that um, we're asking that we come up with our laundry list of things. Believe me, Supervisor Dickinson, I have a laundry list of things I'd love to see changed about the rules of the board, too. Um, but it is definitely something we need to dedicate some time to this year. But in the interest of time, I know Supervisor Molino had a question, and then certainly we want them to get through their PowerPoint, too. Thank you. Yep. Can you talk into the microphone so we just came up with the Collinwood uh, Farm plan and we're asking to the ice cave. And again, in my opinion, I think the board came with my opinion. So I know. Yeah. But then uh, some of the things, like before, they only had 10 or 12 people. So you can kind of step down. Like they said, there's only five plus on the floor. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. So, I, you know, it's not. Well, as Terry, we have to keep in mind if the person who yields the floor, or not yield the floor, has a unique ability um, to to also stifle a debate. So it's important that we're looking at both sides, the positive and the negative of that. And that's why Robert's Pool Rules is putting an emphasis on a chair being neutral. And I am reading a direct note from our administrator as well, who's rightly so pointing out this and perhaps would like to expand upon it. Yeah, and that's that's why Robert's Rules puts an emphasis on, on chairs being neutral is because the chair, you don't have to recognize anybody to speak at the meeting. You control the floor. Uh, and unless your uh, point of order is, is challenged by the committee, the chair's got the right just not to call on somebody if that person doesn't agree with, with their view of the issue. So that's why Robert's Rules puts an emphasis on the chair being neutral. John, can you hear me any better if I take my mask off? Does that help? All right, so does anyone know, know who the vice chair of the board is for 2021? Doug Beatty. Correct, it's Doug Beatty. And does anyone know why or how? No, who cares? Because he's head of finance. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, uh, local law number one of 1968, section 1K, says in the abundance, or I'm sorry, in the case of absence, in the case of absence, incapacity, or inability of the chairman to act for any reason, the audit and finance chairman of the board shall perform the functions, powers, and duties of the chairman within the limits of the statute. Therefore, this definition from Local Law 1 of 1968 equals vice chair of the board. Any questions on that one? Majority and minority leaders of the Warren County Board of Supervisors. Um, I know this is new this year, so we want to put a slide in on it. New York State County Law Section 200 requires that all supervisors be paid in equal amount, except the chair, majority, and minority leaders who may be paid an additional amount. No other positions are authorized to be paid a stipend, except for the budget officer, which is in Section 361 of County Law. I believe do not hold me to that, but it is. Um, section 1, Section A1 of the Warren County Rules of the Board of Supervisors for this current year, 2021, requires that the majority leader is the finance chair and the minority leader is the personnel administration and higher education chair. Uh, this is for 2021. It says the duties may change each year depending on the decision of the chair, but that would have to be reflected in the rules of the board. Uh, Supervisor Wilde Madam, and Supervisor Dickinson. Madam Chairwoman, thank you. Um, Mary, if you could please explain. I, I thought what we had it before. Was there a local law that said we paid a budget officer and another officer? And wouldn't that supersede the county law? There was no local law and no state law that authorized payment of the vice chair. I don't know why that was happening. I don't know where the authority came from. Um, the budget officer can be paid pursuant to New York State County law, and it's in the 300 and the department, so the 351. Uh, Supervisor Dickinson and then Supervisor Garrity. 
Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I, 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 I totally object to this majority minority leader nonsense. Uh, I know you're sick of hearing me say it, but I was here 40 years ago and we had no majority or minor minority leaders at all. And I objected to having them for no specific reason. I don't know what the hell they, they're going to be doing for $6,000, but uh, I object to it uh, totally. Uh, and I certainly object to spending the money. Now, uh, uh, the argument was you were saving money, but you're not. You're, you're you're shuffling money around. You're not saving any money for the taxpayers. And I, I it's totally object to it. It's, it's nonsense. Supervisor Garrity, I know how to comment that I'm happy to, to also address your concerns, Supervisor Dickinson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the budget officer is removed to no thought of his own. Didn't the budget officer be allowed to apply, apply for unemployment benefits during this COVID vaccine? The federal government is paying three hundred dollars, and the state would be paying three hundred. I was removed from my position through no fault of my own, and I've been denied the right to, to apply for unemployment benefits. Just to add a little uh, humor to our meeting tonight. I don't care how to hear that. <laughs> Uh, and it's certainly in the interest of time, as much as I want to keep everyone on our two-hour schedule. Uh, Supervisor Dickinson, I'm happy to give you a call and talk uh, personally as well. This is the first time you and I, I, I've heard that feedback from you, and I would like to be able to talk with you. Um, and I know that Administrator Moore is more than happy also to talk about um, how that problem was identified. Uh, certainly, past practices continue to pay a vice chair um, along with, at one point, that vice chair was also a uh, finance and personnel chair back, uh, I believe it was 2018, maybe, that was split off. And this was looked into at that time, and this board was made aware, or leadership of the board, that we couldn't do it back then. And so all we're going to do is go through the policies, the law, and abide by them. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, but so I don't know if our administrator wants to add to that or our county attorney. I'm sure that yeah, there, there is in terms of how it was found. The question had been asked as to whether the budget officer had to be the, the budget chair or whether it could be two separate individuals. So we did some research based on that as to members of the board of supervisors that are allowed to be paid a stipend. And the state law is very clear that the only supervisors that can make more than a different supervisor are the positions of chair the position of majority leader, the position of minority leader, and the budget officer, so long as the budget officer and the chair of the budget committee is one and the same person. So that's that's all laid out in state law. And it was an oversight of, uh, I don't know how long it had been done that way. I'm sure it was innocently done, but it was an oversight and, and we fixed it. I, I, I have no objection to, to the uh, vice chair and, and the uh, the, the uh, um, budget officer. Budget officer, not at all. I'm not paying the budget officers. They do a lot of work and they earn it. I have a this majority minority thinks is nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. If, if the, the majority party, whatever it is, should be picking who's the majority leader to start with, and the minority leader should do the same. They shouldn't be appointed by by somebody who's in a, a different party. I, I don't I don't understand that. Well, and Supervisor I, Dickinson, thank you for your so comments. And I know that our county attorney has been looking into that for quite some time to determine in the law where it does uh, tell you exactly that, how those are picked at a local level. And so, again, we're really looking forward to this discussion and dialogue in committees so that we can make changes moving forward. Right, well, I think I, that I, idea of all inclusiveness is really important. But let's make sure that Mary has an opportunity to finish the slides that her, both Amanda and Mary worked hard on. And, and we can certainly have more work yeah. well, I, 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 I got my hand up. And I would like to know what the what what, what the uh, 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 description of it is. I, I want to know what they're doing. Supervisor Dickinson, I, I hear you. I appreciate your comments. I want to try to stay with the rules of the board. Uh, and Supervisor Bramer has not been heard from. Her hand is up. Um, Supervisor Bramer. Well, uh, wait a minute. Thank you so I, much. I, I appreciate being called upon. And since I am being called upon, I, I would ask that you do rec call on my colleague, Supervisor Stroud, when I'm finished. 
I think it's very ironic that Supervisor Dickinson thinks it's fine to pay the vice chair and the budget officer for 40 years, even though that wasn't in the law that we were paying these people extra. And it is also very ironic that he thinks it's fine when he's been in the majority party. Dennis, I mean, you're, you that you are registered Republican. You've been in the majority for this amount of time. I, for one, as a member of the minority party at this point in time, think it's actually been really great to raise our presence on the board by having this minority leadership position. And, um, you know, I don't think it's adding anything but good, positive things to have our voices be heard and have a better, stronger seat at the table. As far as the dollar amounts, I mean, these are these have been paid out to other people who weren't really doing anything, and I won't name any names, but you know, there were people on this board who received that stipend and didn't even know they were getting the extra money in their salary. So, well, and, and this year we are getting less overall, so we are saving the taxpayers money, but for you to say that, oh yeah, it's okay for Republicans to get extra money, but no, don't let the Democrat have $6,000 for the work she's doing. Okay, so at this point in time, it's five after six. We certainly appreciate everyone's comments and concerns, and we definitely want to stick to our time frame. What I'm going to ask both Mary and Amanda to do is send out the slides, highlighting those notes that perhaps we didn't have an opportunity to go over, and look forward to another workshop where we can continue these discussions. But uh, we, the rules of the board do state that it's a two-hour workshop, and because action is not taken, I want to thank all of you for your time. And well, I've had a question for a long time. I have had my hand up and I'm getting ignored. Supervisor Stry would never ignore you. And if there's not an oh, objection yeah. to waiving the rules, I, and of course, going over time, I'm more than happy to, to have you ask a question, Supervisor Stry. I, I don't want to ignore you. Well, my question is, I found no law that states that you have to have a majority and minority position. Okay, no law states you have to have one. I haven't found one. If you found one, give it to me. But I have to agree with Supervisor Dickinson. They're bogus, they're divisive, they're polarizing, and a complete waste of money. So I'm just, you know, show me the law that says you have to have those positions. And here's my question. That's my opinion. My question is, uh, what can the Board of Supervisors do to eliminate positions they disagree with? There's my question. Okay. Okay. Before she addresses though, also, would you please send out the law that highlights the, um, the county law? Yeah. So to clarify, there is no law that for me has to have a majority minority, minority leader. It says we may have them. And Thank you. Excellent. The answer to the second question is you all voted on the goal. There's Supervisor the goal. Receiver. So if you do not want Dennis, to. Your, your mic is hot while Mary's trying to answer this question for Supervisor Stroud. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear her. Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is this better? Yes. Okay. So the answer is you either have to change the rules of the board, which you can bring through a motion to third vote to get rid of the minority and majority leader positions. You can also bring a motion which would delete those positions from the county structure. Um, yeah, yeah, the county compensation schedule. So you would need a motion for that. And then I believe you also need two thirds. I'm not, I'm not super sure on that. Amanda? If they want to delete those positions, do they need two thirds as well, or is it just a simple majority? I believe that's two thirds as well because it's subject to a roll call vote, but I would have to double check that. Yeah, then it would typically go through the personnel committee. Um, thank you. And you, I can see Supervisor Dickinson, and, and I'm getting right to you. Just to, to be clear, there were several years ago that we brought up this topic and we're told that. Um, we couldn't waive these salaries or these stipends. So I'm glad to have the law in front of us that specifically is talking about what we're allowed to pay. Not that we have to, but what we're allowed to. And we're still over, and if there's still no objections, we'll still keep talking. Supervisor Dickinson. Thank you very much. I want to respond to uh, Ms. Bramer. In 1978, I was elected supervisor of town of Lake George. I was sworn in in 79, and I quit in 1983. I was a Democrat, 
in a Republican town and on a Republican board, and they had just taken over the power from the Democrats. So you can imagine what kind of position I had. So when, when you tell me that nonsense, I can tell you I've been there, Claudia, and I have no objection to you having a seat or making the money. Uh, I have objection to creating the seat and spending the money. That's what I have objection to. It's nothing to do with you. I, I'm as get far against the majority as I am the minority. It's stupid I, to have two positions we don't need and pay them. I know you were a Democrat before, Dennis. That's why I made that comment. <laughs> That <laughs> didn't, didn't come out that way, Claudia. Okay, well, I, while I recognize discussion is really important, I'm so glad that we're having it and talking about these issues. This is positive. Um, it, now, could we please finish with a PowerPoint presentation that Amanda and Mary are, are continuing to work very hard on? Thank you. Mary, sure. Everyone seems really interested in continuing to have discussion, and, and I think that's a wonderful thing, and I really appreciate that extra time and attention we're all spending on this. It, it's well overdue, so thank you, and we aren't going to have any objection to it. Let's let's have our county attorney finish her hard work here. Okay, I'll try to talk quickly. <laughs> so voting by the Board of Supervisors, um, all members present shall vote. Uh, a majority is 501 of the total weighted voting power of the board. The weight is um, the weights of each town are provided in local law number 12 of 2011, which will change based on the census data. Uh, if there's a resolution that has an, more than one item in it, if a request is made to separate out those items, um, then the resolution can be separated and you can vote on each item separately. We thought it was important here to have a discussion on abstention and refusal. To abstain means to not vote, um, but you can choose to participate in the discussion as long as you do not have a conflict. Recusal, which is not defined by Robert's rules, is generally understood to mean that a member won't participate at all in the consideration of the motion and also will not vote. This means the member will, re will remove themselves from the deliberative process, both physically by moving away from the debate table and intellectually by not participating in the discussion. If you abstain from voting, if you abstain from voting, does that not count or does that count as a no vote? It doesn't count as a no vote, but it takes away from the yes vote. So you need 501 votes for something to pass. So by abstaining, you're essentially, it's the same result as if you voted no. It takes away from your, excuse me, your total in the yes column. So your vote is not registered as a no, but it impacts the positive in the same manner. <laughs> it doesn't reduce the total needed for a majority. So it's not a no, it's truly not a no vote. No. But it does. It affects the total you need to pass in the same manner. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the no. And refusal, you're supposed to have to walk out, right? Right. Well, well, not from the room, from the right, Mary, from the discussion at the debate table. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're sitting here, you're going to the debate table, you're going to be able to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I just thought that the two of those were because you're involved in maybe the life work that I want to be able to do. Why you're seeing yourself. So it's my next slide. Is the definition. Um, so you recuse when you have a conflict, essentially. Um, in Warren County Local Law Number 6 of 2014, which is our ethics law, states no municipal officer may participate in any decision or take any official action with respect to any matter requiring the exercise of discretion, including discussing the matter and voting on it, 
when he or she knows or has reason to know that the action could confer a direct or indirect financial or material benefit on him or herself, a relative, or any private organization in which he or she is deemed to have an interest. He does not have to because it's also a public entity, um, but I would never, I would never opine on whether someone felt comfortable or not voting by law. He does not have to, but if he feels that's the best course, I think that is appropriate. Okay. For sorry, Supervisor Stroud is not on the line or else I'm sure he would have answered that. Um, Amanda, what is going on to go that comes up a lot? Right. Uh, ben Driscoll has a supervisor just caused a question. If we abstain, we are still allowed to talk in the resolution. Couldn't our comments contribute to the vote? So if you're going to abstain and continue to talk on the resolution, that means you do not have a conflict. If you have a conflict, you should remove yourself from the entire discussion and you should have no bearing on the vote. Supervisor Driscoll, does that answer that question? Exactly. I want clarification on that. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Any more questions? Um, our ethics law says that even if you have a conflict, you can still vote um, for the following matters. Adoption of the Warren County's annual budget, any matter requiring the exercise of discretion that directly affects any of the following groups of people or lawful class of such groups, all municipal officers or employees, all residents or taxpayers of the municipality or an area of the municipality or the general public, and any matter that does not require the exercise of discretion. So even if you have a conflict, you can vote in all of those situations. Recusal and abstention is not required with the following matters, and I apologize, there is a typo on there. Um, any matter that comes before the Board of Supervisors, Standing Committee, or Special Committee, when a majority of the membership would be prohibited from acting because of a conflict. Any matter which cannot lawfully be delegated to another person. So again, you can participate in any voting or discussions um, in those matters, even if you have a conflict. Votes that require a roll call pursuant to our rules, fixing or altering salaries, establishing salary and wage classifications, adoption of the budget, appropriation or expenditure of public funds, transfer to and from a 0.1 salary code within the authorized budget, transfers between funds, including capital and road fund projects, levying of taxes, bond resolutions, Authorizations to fund or refund indebtedness, legalizing informal acts of a town meeting, village election, town or village officer, legalizing municipal obligations incurred through error or mistake where a two thirds vote is required, alteration of the boundaries of a town, local laws, sale or conveyance of county property, and amending occupancy tax spending guidelines. Resolutions that require a two-thirds vote, 667 weighted votes for this board. Creating positions, filling of vacant positions um, when they are denied in the nor normal process, which we will discuss in a coming slide. Rescinding, suspending, waiving, or changing the rules of the board. And I do want the board to be aware that there are other times that a two-thirds vote is required by law but we are not getting into those here. We will get into those at another time. These were just the situations in our rules which call for a two-thirds vote. A roll call vote will be taken upon the request of any member. A resolution adopted shall become effective upon their adoption or is otherwise provided by law or is specified in the resolution. All right, this is filling a vacant positions here at the county. 
Filling of a vacant position is authorized with the following approvals. The county administrator, the budget officer, a majority vote of the appropriate oversight committee. Once a position is approved for filling, it remains in effect for six months. The sheriff is authorized to fill positions that become vacant in the correctional facility, provided the staffing levels do not exceed 75 correction officers, nine correction sergeants, two correction lieutenants, and one correction captain. If there is an emergency to fill a vacancy and the oversight committee has not denied filling that vacancy and they will not convene again for one week or more, the chair of the oversight committee can call a special meeting or the chair can approve the filling of the position and report such approval to the committee at the next meeting. Whether or not the filling of a, of a vacant position meets the classification of an emergency is determined by the proper oversight committee chair. All right, just some general rules. The clerk of the board shall draft without the need of a resolution, a proclamation of acknowledgement, congratulations, condemnation, or recognition upon request by any member, but it will be executed by the chair. No standing rule shall be rescinded, suspended, or changed, or any additional rule or order added unless by two thirds consent. And the suspension only applies to what's in front of the board at the time. It does not continue after that specific motion that's in front of the board. The rules may be amended at any time. All questions not covered in the rules of the board are decided in accordance with Robert's Rules of Order revised. The rules of the board are published in the proceedings in the year which they are adopted or whenever they are amended. And they will continue in full force and effect unless a new set of rules is adopted by the board. Thank you. And on the back of the PowerPoint, too, there's a slide that talks about future training items. Please feel free to email Amanda or, as always, and I, I very much mean this. I know that Supervisor Dickinson has walked, gone away from his uh, video and Supervisor Stroud had to leave, as did some other supervisors. Uh, but please keep in mind, the phone line is always open. The email is on chat will be returned and I certainly appreciate an opportunity for a chance at success as your chair of your board this year. I hope we're all rowing in the same direction. Thank you for taking time out more time than we thought tonight to talk about this and if you have questions or concerns and they're valuable obviously to the entire board please use that Warren County Supervisors you know all button so that we can communicate and benefit from each other's questions and answers uh, but this that, again, thank you. The dialogue is a good thing. Debate in a respectful manner is always welcomed. And I appreciate your time tonight. And Amanda and Mary, really excellent job. I think that we've all learned a lot and had such a nice evening together. So, good job. Amen. I agree with her. <laughs> great job, Mary. Amanda, thank you. We're going to close the meeting. I don't need a motion because we don't take action in this. But again, thank you so much. And uh, good night. Good night and thank you.